distinguished guests, distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen, I want to express my deep gratitude to CVL for giving me this distinct honor to interact with you today. The last time I was in this building is, was in 2015. I had to also do a keynote address for a graduating class of the Lagos Business School, so I'm very honored to be back and I also want to join everybody in congratulating our youngest PhD President Obasanjo. I know each time some of us feel that we have achieved what he has achieved or aiming to achieve what he has achieved, he sets another standard and now he's given us a reason to understand that in fact life begins at 80. To Pato Tomi, happy birthday. I'm happy to be here with you. Actually, I needed time to take a break from the campaign as well. It was getting too hot. <laughs> I give the same theme of speech around Africa today. I'll change the beginning and the end, but the core is still the same. I talk about Africa is hot, H-O-T. Africa has to have hope because it has a lot of opportunity, but it must transform. So if you hear some of what I say here and they say, oh, he said it in Ghana last year, it is true. If they tell you he said the same at Oxford University last year, it is true. Because my mission, as I see it, is deliberately and persistently trying to convince the next generation of Africans that they must be better, they ought to be better, and they should be greater than everybody else. So it's always a message of hope, because I know the international media will do the rest of showing the disaster stories, but I prefer to stick to the good stories about Africa. But also it, it is true that we have to reflect on the past as well, so that we don't make some of the mistakes we've made already over time. Don't know if my slides are ready. I know they had a technical difficulty at the beginning. Are the slides ready? Good. So, Pat wanted us to talk a little bit about leadership. Many of you are leaders in your own right. And so anywhere I want to talk about leadership or growth in Africa, it reminds me of the story of the professor who was giving the same speech everywhere. And one time he was going to give, it, it was a professor of quantum physics. He was going to give the same speech somewhere and he was rehearsing at the back of the car with his slides. And the driver said to him, Professor, can I deliver your speech tonight? So he was very curious. He said, why do you think you can deliver a speech on, on quantum physics? He said, well, you gave the same speech for 20 years. I memorized it each time you rehearse at the back of the car. So they went to California and the professor dressed like the driver and sat in the audience. The driver went on stage, gave a fantastic speech. He got a standing ovation. So when they sat down, he said, since you understand me so well and you understood everything I said, now I ask my driver to deal with the questions and, and write the equations on the board. So it's the same way I feel today seeing President Obasanjo and other leaders and another aspiring president in the room. I know many of you have the answers to Africa's problems. But indeed, if you look at the last 40 years, we went through a period of Afro-pessimism. Afro-pessimism from the 70s up to the late 90s, even up to the early 2000s. Afro-pessimism, and the question Pat asked at the beginning, which he wanted the heads of state to reflect on, it's part of where I'll spend a little bit, five minutes. Because a few weeks ago here in Nigeria, one of your business icons asked me the same question at dinner. He knew, in for, in, of course, that I was uh, as, uh, running for president. And he said, but Dr. Yumkela, can you tell me, can you tell me why we missed that great decade of globalization, when all the economies, in fact, were moving ahead? I said, well, I don't have answers. I don't have something to tell you but I can at least explain to you what others have said if you look at that period 1990 to about 2007 it was one of the most extraordinary periods in global economies the rest of the world was growing very fast 
And if you look at the, if you read the book by Farid Zakaria, the post-American world, the post-American world which he had out in 2008, he shows that in fact the four decades before 2007, the world realized the fastest growing or growth in its economy ever in history. The rest of the world, ROW, was moving in one direction with globalization. Global output increased from 22.8 trillion to about 53 trillion by 2007. Massive growth. Of course, because of IT, because of trade liberalization and technological advancement. Global trade itself increased by 133% for the rest of the world. China alone, by, by between 1990 and 2005, China lifted over 500 million from below the poverty line. Never seen in, in human history. But then for Africa, and if you put the slide up again, we were moving in the opposite direction. So people call it the lost decades of Africa. And if you look at the TED uh, a presentation by Ngozi, Ngozi talks about this. She says, yeah, somehow we were left behind. The rest of the world moving this way, we moving backwards. In fact, in that same period, we added 93 million more people below the poverty line. So some people ask, what are the reasons? There are many reasons. I chose from literature maybe four that I want us to reflect on. You can ask yourself how many of those apply to Nigeria. The first one, accredited sometimes to Ali Mazrui and others, they talk about the Garden of Eden syndrome. You know when God created the earth, put Adam and Eve, gave them everything, right? Dominion over the animals and the plants. You can pick up anything and eat it. So some argue that maybe we got too much. Maybe Nigeria got too much oil and gas. Ah, but that was not enough. God gave them cocoa and coffee too. And solid minerals. So some people say if you live in the Garden of Eden, your creativity goes backwards. You take everything for granted because God loves only you. So some people say it's the Garden of Eden syndrome. Do you believe that? It's up to you. Others say, Jim, Jared Diamond in 19, 19, uh, 1977, he says, but there's all another explanation, geographic determinism. Where countries find themselves on the globe determines where they go, whether they can they can command nature, transform nature to suit them. So Africa has too much diseases because of its climate. So they can't do good livestock like the Europeans and the Americans. Well, do you believe that? Brazil has the same climate. So does Malaysia and Indonesia. But they are second world and advancing to first world. But hey, that was his view. Ge geographic determinism. Paul Collier, who they've called a great friend of Africa and Nigeria, former head of the Center for African Studies, he and I interact a lot over the years. He came out with his book in 2005, The Bottom Billion. And the bottom billion, the poorest one billion of the earth, most of them living in Africa. He said, ah, he identified four factors. Conflicts was one of them. Indeed, we know. And I know that because Sierra Leone went through it. He said, but there is also, he also agreed that abundant natural resources could be a problem. Some call it the Dutch disease and so on. Being landlocked is a problem, he also said. And then bad governance. So he calls it the four traps. Conflict, abundant natural resources, being landlocked, and also bad governance. Well, Austria is landlocked. I lived there 17 years. They're amongst the best of the world. So is uh, Switzerland. Is that true? I don't know. Uh, Brazil has a lot of natural resources but they're damn good in agricultural production. They're amongst the best in the world. So, but again, this was his view. Ah, in the middle of all of this debate, Dambisa Moyo, Zambian economist, she was trained by Paul Collier. She said, Professor, with all due respect, she was at Oxford University. She shocked the world, she shocked me because then I was a big shot at the United Nations. Dambisa Moyo, sister African, came out with a brilliant book. She called it, Dumb aid. Dumb aid. That in fact it's aid that caused Africa's problems. That we had too much of it. And we became dependent on it. Maybe it's another version of the Garden of Eden syndrome. I call it the receivership mentality. 
the receivership mentality that we sometimes feel that somebody else should come with a solution some white knight from somewhere you know aid comes and they come with all the ideas how you and i should grow how we should develop so this young lady and he gave the statistics of how much aid we had received and said maybe that has caused the problem we're waiting for somebody all the time to come solve the problems of africa when our good people in the continent tell us how to do it we don't believe it we don't trust them when our own businessmen do well we don't celebrate them somebody tells us that maybe it's corruption not everybody is corrupt for god's sake people are innovative we don't celebrate innovation our own innovation because somehow we're waiting for somebody and from my experience in industrialization no country the industrializes another one none especially industrialization in fact paul kagami his excellency paul kagami said in 207 and i quote him the primary reason that there is little to show for the more than three billion dollars of aid that has gone to africa since 1970 is that in the context of post second world war geopolitical and strategic rivalries and economic interests much of the aid was spent creating and sustaining client states and one type or the other with minimal regards for developmental outcomes on the continent he was not saying aid was all responsible he was saying maybe it had a cause but again i debunk that we're not the only people who received aid the asians did but they used it right they used it to build institutions not big men and big women powerful men and women they used aid strategically to unlock potential ah but even the europeans needed aid at one time they got the marshall plan thanks to the marshall plan they were able to rebuild their nations after World War II. Some were decimated. Ah, but they used it well to invest in competitiveness, to invest in institutions that will ensure that they never needed aid again. So what am I saying? You choose which of these five apply to Nigeria. I guess my own conclusion is some of it is true, but it doesn't condemn you. It depends on what you do with what you have. If you live in the Garden of Eden, I call it comparative advantage. Use it to transform. If you live in a country that is receiving a lot of aid because other people sympathize with you, use it so that you wean yourself of that aid. If others are ad advancing, you also look at what they've done and say, how does this apply to us? But leadership has a role in this. So part, I gave you my own favorite choices of what might have held us back. But of course, President Obasanjo was sitting in the chair several times. He knows better than I do. I don't know which applies, but you decide what applies to Nigeria. But all in all, all in all, a final constraint, which was identified late 90s, was governance. That all of this is true, part of it, but nothing trumps governance. If you have good governance, you will know how to harness the Garden of Eden, to cultivate it, to cherish it, and to make it expand and become several Gardens of Eden. If you have good governance, you will know exactly how to channel that aid that somebody else's generosity has brought to help rescue you. So governance matters. And therefore, let me just talk a little bit about governance. Why governance is so crucial. If you look at Asian countries as well, they went through their own cycles. I mean, in the 60s and 70s, Cambodia, Vietnam, Laos, we call them basket cases too. But they transformed. They transitioned. So none of us are condemned to be backward. It is what the leadership does. And so leadership has a bigger role. Governance, perhaps, of all the explanations I have seen, there's none more profound than governance. The transitions of various countries and regions that we have observed have had as much to do with governance and leadership styles, and it has had to do with than it has had to do with 
exogenous macro conditions. I hear sometimes people blaming the conditions of the world that is affecting us. I even hear people coming up with conspiracy theories. As if there is a conspiracy against Africa. Maybe it was true in the 17th century because people were having mercantilist approaches. They wanted to source natural resources. But it was true for Asia too. So the leadership style, the governance style, matters as to how you transition. Because yes, others who had the same conditions, Vietnam, Laos, India and others, they changed in spite of colonialism, in spite of conspiracies. So we, our style of leadership matters. The second point I'll make, the linkage between governance quality and leadership cannot be overstated. Good governance begs for leaders who stand for something larger than themselves and can consistently do what is right for the people. Such leaders have been rare in Africa, even more so today than at independence. And this may help explain why we have had so many failed states or failing states or conflicts. The insecurities, for example, of leaders like Amin, Bukasa, Ngwema, Mobutu, Do, Taylor, and others combined, have turned out to be their people's undoing. Some leaders become so insecure that everything is about holding on to that power. So they will build institutions, in fact, to make sure that the power remains in their hands. They will not build the institutions that will transform the state. So sometimes the insecurity, ah, they will even push ethnic divisions so that their own ethnic people keep them in power in, with, with the argument that they bring the cookie home for them as well. State failures are ipso facto leadership failures. And states fail and collapse because of what leaders and governments do or fail to do or are incapable of doing. It is also true that we don't vet the leadership well. People come out to be presidents, parliamentarians, for whatever reason, ethnicity, cash, or something else, we put them in leadership. Some are plain incapable of doing what we need to do in the 21st century. And people tell me, even in my own country, that na common sense are too much book sense. Too much book sense in the 21st century that is going to the fourth industrial revolution, that is going to digitization and the internet of things. You better have leaders who understand these concepts in the 21st century. Climate change, ah, Abba, what, which one is? They even don't understand or believe that climate change is real. You better do. When I sat with Mele Zinawi a few times of Ethiopia, he knew what climate change meant. He was the first African leader to de develop a green growth strategy for Ethiopia. I had the opportunity to moderate a session with him, for him in, in Copenhagen under the Green Growth uh, Forum. And I sat with him in the green room before others came. I said, why did you go into green growth? He said, my, my son, or my brother, because we were about the same age then. He said, my brother, I know what drought does in Ethiopia. I know that four years after drought, too much rain comes and washes my soil away. If I don't do something because others are polluting and causing greenhouse gases, my soil will disappear. So he invested in green growth. But he was not satisfied. He called the Danes, the Koreans, and others to help him develop a green growth strategy with industrialization and climate resilience built in. Some other leaders, plenty rain come today. They say, now God give us. There is drought tomorrow. Now God give us. Ah, there is no understanding of the concept. When we say under climate change, there will be the frequency of extreme weather effects. So it means they will come even more. Therefore, your economy has to be climate resilient. Therefore, your agriculture has to be smart agriculture to harvest rain and make sure when the drought comes, you can still irrigate. What am I saying? Leadership quality matters. That leadership quality will impinge on the governance quality. So things have to change. People have to come into politics. So people ask me, you had a good career in the UN. You were already under Secretary General 12 years. 
you could have stayed another 10. Why the heck did you go home? Or why do you want to go home? This was back in 2014. And we had Ebola too. I said, it is now they need me. I've seen these cycles. And we've had this other disaster after civil war. I need to go home to take the experience I have to bring it to my people. Because I have seen possibility. I've been to Vietnam, to the factories, to Cambodia. I've been there. I've been to Rwanda. I've been to Ghana and Cote d'Ivoire and Senegal. If they are transforming now, I can do it. But I was here with Obasanjo's regime as well. I saw it. I saw when Obasanjo said, debt relief. I was in the diplomatic community to say, ah, ah, this niche in Nigeria, what is he talking about? But he stuck to it. And guess what? By the time I left here after two, two, uh, three years, 2000 to 2003, his debt manage, management officer came to Vienna, to the OPEC fund, and we asked him to do a seminar. And he said, let me tell you a secret. When we were going for the negotiations, Obasanjo said, how much have they forgiven? We showed him. He said, when you get there, tell them I want to pay off all. He said, when we said that in the negotiations, everybody was shocked. No, 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 no. We don't want you to pay all off. We're going to forgive some. You'll pay the rest over time. And the young man said, I cannot go back that and tell my president. He says, we will pay off the rest. That's visionary leadership. And he paid it off. But he did not only pay it off. He left 20 billion cash. You can deny it. But I was there too. He left 20 billion cash. When he said he would privatize digital mobile, I was here. I remember the arguments. State assets. They want to give our state assets to the private sector, the airlines. He privatized it. And I did see the internet revolution happen here. He's not alone. There are others who have put Africa on another pedestal. That's why I have hope. That's why I talk more about hope. So I have shown you that, yes, there were hard times. I have shown you that there were constraints, but I have also made the case. The style of leadership, the leader matters, but it's not the president alone, the ministers, the corporate leaders. It matters. So I transition to the future. The hope and opportunity that I see. Why, in fact, it was not only the problems that drove me to come to Sierra Leone. I use, let me talk about the problems. I'll sit in United Nations meetings. Every statistics on advanced development, we're at the bottom. Highest maternal mortality rate even today. Today, over 60% youth unemployment. Yeah? Our debt is $2 billion For a country whose GDP for the year is about $3 billion. But we had debt forgiveness in 2005. How come we accumulated so much? For what? Ah, but this is the country with one of the largest deposits of iron ore. One of the largest deposits of titanium. Diamonds, gold, 7 million people. But every statistic you look at us, highest infant mortality rate. I say, this is not right. So I, I've come home to help. But I know leadership matters. So I threw my hat in that I want to be president too. To bring knowledge back home. To bring hope and opportunity. In other words, for you, the businessmen and intellectuals, don't have an excuse and stay back. The interesting thing about politics, my people tell me, especially my best friends, some of them in Europe, America, I'm not going back. I'm not interested in politics. I say, okay, sit there. Politics go do you. Politics go do you. They will keep calling you to pay school fees. They will keep calling you to pay for hospital. And so on and so forth. Because poverty is deepening. Ah, but when there is conflict, your own relatives will become refugees. So, but there is hope. There's a lot of hope that Africa, we can do more. That's my belief, why I'm coming home. Because I believe we can transform. And I've seen it, that it is possible. Now, this is not working. Okay. You saw all of these messages back in 2011. Africa rising. And if you look at the third lecture by uh, Ngozi again, you'll see her talk about this. I'll not describe them. But suddenly by 2011, there was this positive story about Africa that we were rising. Everybody wanted to be part of this new literature, praising Africa. Yeah, you see all of them. All kinds of statistics about how we, we are growing. This is acting up.
technician it's going back and forth the bottom line is Africa did change Africa did change I give you some numbers and you look at the projections for the future for 2020 2030 2050 you see some good numbers we will still be amongst the fastest growing economies as a region not as individual countries in fact sub-saharan africa or the the economy almost doubled from 20 from 2000 to 2013 to about 2.7 trillion from 2000 to 2013 the economy almost doubled to 2.7 trillion sub-saharan africa in fact is projected that by 2040 the economy could quadruple it could remember these are forecasts there is rising income in the middle class this is why you see all these shopping malls opening up now other people see opportunity some of us see problems because of this idea of the rising middle class over 400 million maybe 500 million people in the middle class people are opening opening shopping centers here in nigeria i see a lot of them because they see opportunity the rise of the african urban consumer when i was here lagos business school taught me about the indomie story we didn't think our children will stop eating gary but they did they continued eating the gary but they started buying indomie and they minted money so this urban consumerism we can capture especially with the youth there is the rising demand for food our population will be 1.3 billion by 2030 2035 2.2 billion by 2050 2050 is not far it's around the corner who is going to feed these people we're going to add another billion of our brothers and sisters because we we also do something very well yeah who is going to feed them are we going to be begging for food but we can feed them for me i see it as an opportunity and of course you've seen the digital revolution what has happened with with uh, mobile phones These are the numbers I just gave you. I talked about potential. Yeah. I gave you the potential to give you hope that indeed things, the, the future looks bright. Some say the future could be much better than even the present. But for me, because I'm heading towards the conclusions now, for me, these are the main challenges com for competitiveness. But I also call it transitions. We have to go through these transitions. The number one is how we manage the demographic transition. We're going to add more young men and women. In fact, we'll have the youngest population across the world. We'll be, all these are hungry young men and women ready to produce, ready to be productive. But how we harness it depends on, of course, education, skills formation, and what we do for our women. I say this, why? When I, go, when I used to go to Vietnam, doing lectures like this on industrialization, and I talk about population problems and the growing world population, the Vietnamese or the Indians will say, slow down, Dr. Yumkela. We don't see bigger population now as a problem. We see it as our demographic dividend. Can we harvest these young people? Imagine 2050, 2.2 billion Africans, maybe 60% of them below 30. How will we use it? Ah, will we fall in the Garden of Eden syndrome again? Treat it like any raw material. Because more young people is like new minerals. They're young. They're there to be plucked. Ah, but they're there to be nurtured, to be the factory workers for Africa, like the Vietnamese have done, the Cambodians have done. Why do I talk about women? In these countries, when I go to the textile mills, in Bangladesh, in Vietnam, in Cambodia, most of the workers are women in the garment industry. But they are not alone. I've seen it in, in Botswana too. I've seen it in Lesotho in particular. In Lesotho at one point, they employed 36,000 people in the garment factories. Most of them were women. Most of them were women. I also visited a factory in Lesotho, set up by Philips to make energy efficient bulbs. 
40% of the people being trained before the factory was built were women. So I asked the manager of Phillips, why are you doing this? He said they're better with their hands and more careful. But they were making energy efficient bulbs because I was dealing with energy efficiency. That was the curiosity. So what we do with them, how we educate the women, empower them, Nigeria could be the next garment producer of the world. Because guess what? You have cotton too. The second one, we must directly support industrialization. President Obasanjo will say, young man, wake up. We told them this already in the Abuja Declaration back in 85. That Africa must industrialize. We talk about it, but we don't do it. Maybe partly because of the Garden of Eden Syndrome. Every single African country that has discovered a new mineral in the last 20 years has not used it for industrialization. We've done the same thing everybody does. Everybody sits and waits for the export of that mineral to share the wealth. Not to invest in diversification as fast as we should. Industrialization, one prime minister in Asia told me, is never by accident. It is by choice. In the Asian countries, after we were told in Africa, on the structural adjustment, that we should not have industrial policy, the Asian countries kept it. They had industrial policy, and in fact, in Europe and the United States, they've always had industrial policy. Because industrialization and tran economic transition takes long, 20, 30 years. So you must have a deliberate policy that will be there consistent for 20, 30 years for people to risk capital into industrialization. So policy consistency, having a, an industrial policy is crucial. Otherwise, and also one that links agriculture and industry. In Malaysia, I took part of Tomi and some of your ministers to Malaysia back, it was 2001. Uh, President Obasanjo, you didn't know this because they, they took permission, the ministers, but I, I organized it. Kola Jamodo, right? Ta, uh, Pauline Talent, well, uh, Minister of Industry was Kola Jamodo. Pauline Talent was Minister for Science and Technology. You had just appointed Ikweme's daughter as private sector advisor. Pato Tomi, uh, and the head of Manufacturers Association. I took them to Malaysia. It was not just about palm oil, but I used palm oil as the case study to send the message home about how you industrialize. I took them to every ministry that had impact and research centers that made Malaysia number one in oil pan. And that year they announced what they call zero, zero waste in palm oil. That's why the delegation went. President Obasanjo approved. And we went there. They showed us. They have a museum. They show you the time they came to Africa for the jam plaza. But then they show you what science did. They changed the jam plaza. They modified it. Then they will tell you how new management came into play to establish plantations. Not subsistence farming. Industrial plantations. Then they show you research and development. They made 35 products out of one palm oil. 35. That's why they call it zero waste. The bark is used for, I mean, what we put on tabletops. The leaves, they were experimenting with support from Japan. How they can use the leaves, the protein in the leaves, to make ration for livestock production. Why? They were importing too much from the United States of corn. Can they substitute, and soybeans, can they substitute zero waste? But what happened? They borrowed something from Africa, applied science and technology, backed by research, good policy support from science and tech to industrial, the Ministry of Trade and Industry to transform that product. We must, number three, invest in energy and infrastructure. I will not even open that debate because that has been my life for 10 years. President Obasanjo knows. I have said Africa cannot industrialize without affordable, reliable energy. We can't irrigate our farms regularly to grow three crops instead of one if we don't, cannot pump that water. We cannot have good sanitation if we cannot pump that water and purify it. So I don't need to make the case for energy here, but I lived here. And when I come here, I still get power interruption. After 20 years, I say we they look behind, we know they look forward. When I was here two weeks ago, and I was told there were queues still for petrol, I said, this cannot be happening. I came here as a young minister back in 95 to beg Nigeria
to send some oil and oil for us for our generators in Sierra Leone. That time they told me, "Ah, you crazy? You know, see we queues. Why are we still having queues if we have four four refiners? Why? Let us be frank. Shouldn't happen. You can rotate repairs, but the same problems seem to stick here. They stay. They stay. They don't move. So energy and in infrastructure. I don't need." how you get that to make competitiveness of the economy, reduce the cost of doing business. We have to accelerate inter-regional trade. That you know already. We trade with ourselves. The Asians do it a lot. In fact, I know in Asia, 50 or 60 percent of the investments in the region come from the region. We can do that too. How the leadership will recognize these and push it, whether that's part you want to call them values, I call it all transitions. How we manage those transitions. But we must build climate resilience. I have spent a good 10 years of my time in the UN dealing with energy and climate change. The reality is the following. We account for less than 3% of greenhouse gas emissions. But all the projections of the worst impact will be here in Africa. So if somebody else is doing something that will make us be bad and suffer, don't we want to act? So those who debate whether climate change is real or not in Africa, we feel it. We get rains in Sierra Leone in December now. We were not used to, which is affecting our cropping cycle. But climate resilience, also the, the roads. You build a road, if it is not climate resilient, the first storm, 10 years of investment washes away. You have to start all over again. So climate resilience matters, how we manage that. Next slide, I mean, the same slide. And then I'll go to the very last one. The same slide, please. Yeah. The last one, enhance good governance and move to the developmental state. Give me the next slide. I've talked about governor, but why the developmental state? No. Move again. Move again. Yeah. The de back. The developmental state. These are the characteristics of states in Asia, but also in Europe and Latin America. What the leadership did to ensure that their governance structure was about development. The developmental state. They made sure they promoted economic development by explicitly favoring certain sectors. It is not by accident. If Nigeria wants to be the largest gas producer in the world, Nigeria has to invest in it. It will not happen by accident. Number two, they commanded competent bureaucracies. They tell you the stories of France. Some of the most educated people who later on became presidents and mayors were trained in special schools. Special schools in Asia, in Japan. They tell you about their bureaucrats. And I have met them. They're among some of the best. And you see that in America and elsewhere as well. So yes, our civil service, because they're always there. They tell the minister what to take to parliament, for God's sake. Those bureaucracies have to be efficient. That's what the others did. Placing robust, competent public institutions at the center of development. Those institutions include universities, research centers. As I say, common sense has a limit. Common sense cannot build an aeroplane or a computer. So you need good academic institutions, good research centers to back public policy. When we elect leaders who don't understand the complexity of development and do not value research and evidence-based policy, we will be in trouble clearly articulating social and economic goals and deriving political legitimacy from their record of development. Leaders should be praised for their development record, not how much they are smart enough to hold on to power. The last slide and I'll go. How does all of this apply to Nigeria? Now I want you to be angry with me. I first used this, I think it was um, when the UK was doing the Olympics. Nigeria organized an investment forum at the Royal Dorchester. They asked me to be one of the keynotes. So I sat with a Nigerian niece of mine, and we were talking, and I was explaining how, what I think of Nigeria. She said, Uncle, let me draw something for you. We lost it, so last night my daughter, who is married to a Nigerian, is in the, in the room. We sat together last night. Put it up. I said, this is how I see Nigeria, putting all of this together. Your next set of leaders should want to do this. I call it the Nigerian Triangle. You must have infrastructure that connects Kano to Lagos. 
What do I mean? Rail. Rail that can carry cargo. You must have it that way. So the yellow lines are where your rail links are. Kano, Lagos, Port Harcourt, Calabar, back to Kano. You do the same homework at home. Use your computer. That rail from Calabar to Kano cuts across Benway, your bread basket. I used to go there. You see the circles. Those are your growth poles. Pat will say, yes, Kande, the theory of growth poles. If these areas develop, they lift the rest of Nigeria. But you see in the middle, I put a green line. You can connect that too. Makodi straight to Lagos. You're connecting your population centers by infrastructure to resource centers. But you can also specialize. Your southern region should be your energy and petrochemical hub. I'm not talking about the usual debates. Invest, you make a decision that the next 50 billion or 100 billion you make over the next five years, you will transform the south to be your power engine of Nigeria. I lived in Austria. They were buying energy from their neighbors. We have to trade in energy. But yes, you can do more for fertilizer. You can do more for all kinds of downstream petrochemicals. With this kind of infrastructure, you follow the same yellow lines with your gas pipelines. You can do the same with telecoms. In that middle, all of those areas rise, and it is not new. If you go to South Korea, they will tell you General Park. General Park did the same thing 40 years ago. One highway became now today what they call the industrialization diamond. Because that one man had vision to do that linkage, everything else has been built around it. The, the ship making companies, their steel works, their microprocessors all around the diamond. You have your own diamond. And I emphasize this because one of the things that bothered me in Nigeria, we come with a good idea. I came back from Malaysia with the idea of the small and medium the, uh, industry development authority. I showed them that in Malaysia it was very small, not more than 50 employees. So the money that government gave them went to support SMEs and industries. When we finished designing it in Nigeria, every local government said they wanted an office. Those who were working with me to design it quickly went to Senate and decided they wanted a big building and 20 motor cars already. So what did we create? A bureaucracy, not an effective institution to in fact support the private sector. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to talk to you. I hope I provoked you enough. Thank you very much.